Meet a young woman who's helping women of all ages find empowering life strategies through work inspired by black feminists. We'll find out how next on Black Issues Forum. Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV. everyone, welcome to Black Issues Forum. I'm Deborah Holt Noel. African American women are often identified by their strength and power, yet so many are living lives filled with victimization, oppression, isolation, and self-doubt. Our guest today is working to help women prevent and overcome these challenges in their lives, and today we'll find out how. I'd like to introduce Dr. Alexis Pauline Gums, an author and black feminist activist. Dr. Gums, Thank you. welcome to Black Issues Forum. First, let's just start off with the definition of uh, what a black feminist is. There's the feminist movement, and then there's black feminism. What's the difference? Black feminism is a movement that, um, well, black feminists identify it as coming out of generations and generations of revolutionary action by black women. One of the strongest influences on the black feminist movement are definitely the civil rights movements and black power movements. So women within those movements who wanted to look at how different types of oppression intersect were the first people who named themselves as black feminists. And this particular uh, movement has not always had support from the black community. That's true. There have been a lot of people who have found it divisive or have thought that when you start talking about sexism within black communities or within black movements, it's something that can distract from the real issue. But black feminists have always believed that actually it serves the entire black community for women to be powerful. And you, there are a number of black feminists. I mean, you've studied, uh, I'm sure, many, many, many of them. But there are, who are the ones that in particular have uh, inspired and informed your work? There are so many, <laughs> but. <laughs> but I know that you mentioned um, Octavia Butler, for example, why her? Octavia Butler is, is like a prophet. I feel like we're actually living in times that Octavia Butler predicted in her speculative fiction and science fiction that she wrote. And so she's somebody who really took the initiative to envision the implications of the power dynamics that we are living through now and what they would mean for our species as human beings, how human beings might grow and evolve, how we could relate to each other in the future. And she always had these strong black women who were the protagonists of her stories who showed how powerful black women can be. And then she herself uh, had um, some challenges with fitting in because of her height, be, just just because of her height for, <laughs> for one thing. But but talk a little bit about how you use, I guess, her life and her stories um, in your workshops with, with young women. Okay, absolutely. Well, during our survival series, we actually used Octavia Butler's parable series, the parable of the sower and the parable of the talents, to think about the future and specifically to think about food justice and resource issues that we're facing in our community right now. So at Stanford L. Warren Library most recently we had an amazing interactive workshop. All the people who showed up were geniuses and were absolutely futuristic thinkers and we looked at the different case studies of what happens in the future world not that far off, about 10 years off that Octavia Butler predicts in those books and how we could think about those problems proactively, how we could think about empowering our communities in a way that transforms what our future might look like. Now, uh, you mentioned the survival series, and this took place at the Durham Public Library. You may do it again, but why is it called the survival series? It's called the survival series because it looks at issues that are most pressing, especially for us in Durham. And Stanford L. Warren is a historically black library, so especially issues that are facing black communities in Durham. So food justice and education were two issues that have been really important to our communities and our families. Amazing activists um, have been addressing these issues. And so 
my role as a black feminist nerd and as somebody who loves black women writers was to bring the wisdom of black women writers from the past, in the case of Octavia Butler and June Jordan, women who are ancestors, and say, okay, so what do their writings bring to this movement? What is there that they already saw or maybe asked about that we can look at as a resource as we take action around food justice and education today? Well, I think it's really exciting when you have the opportunity to work with young people. And um, as these workshops have been well attended, I would imagine by all ages, but to talk particularly about what you're hearing from the young black female community and, and what you're trying to instill in them. Absolutely. Particularly here in Durham. Yes. Well, we just started our Indigo After School Tea Party series, which is um, specifically for 11 year old girls. A and tea party series. <laughs> So we have tea. Another tea party. <laughs> right. We have, we have a, a much more peaceful, much more loving um, version of drinking tea together after school. And the young women are able to relate to each other. And specifically, Indigo is the name of the character from a novel, Sassafras, Cypress, and Indigo by Entezaki Shange. And she's the youngest sister, and she is a creative genius, she plays the violin, she creates her own dolls, and she has a lot of things to say and a lot of things that she writes about, but not a lot of people to listen to her. And so we've been talking about what it takes to be, to be a good listener, to find good listeners, how can we express ourselves, and so the young women have created their own dolls that exemplify what a compassionate, good listener is, and we've been talking about it from, from that perspective. And the young women have a lot to say about the schools that they go to and what it um, what it means to be sitting still all day. They've just started middle school and so they're sitting still for a much longer period of the day than they were in elementary school and some of them have a strong critique of that or how many fights they've witnessed at their school and how they feel about that, what they feel like would make a difference around that. And so I think just to provide a great space to listen and to understand that young black women are leaders and they have so much in, in their perspective and in their creativity to offer our community as something to nurture early on and forever. Now you've worked with uh, communities in Durham and, and Raleigh and other uh, cities as well, mostly in the Triangle. Um, is there a difference between the needs that you see uh, being brought to the workshops in of the ch when you're doing something in Durham versus say Raleigh? Talk a little bit about the Durham community and, and what it's got to offer and what the, the, those participants are bringing to the workshops as, as concerns. Durham is a place with such a strong history. So a lot of the young women that I've worked with throughout the years have generations of amazing women in their families who've made a strong contribution to Durham. So they actually are beneficiaries of that. They actually have a form of perspective that I think is really powerful. And one of the things that I think is unique about Durham is that there is that kind of intergenerational legacy that folks have, where it's not, I mean, the young women who are in the Indigo series, I have also organized alongside their mothers, some of them their grandmothers. And so I think there's something really special about how community coheres through family in Durham that has inspired me and has had me grown as an activist in ways I never would have known. Um, another one of your projects is the Mobile Homecoming. What is that and how does that work? The Mobile Homecoming is an experiential archive project. It's a national project amplifying black feminist LGBTQ um, genius and brilliance across generations. So my partner Julia and I actually travel in a 1988 Winnebago all over the country and we interview visionaries and we host intergenerational events and we have educational events that we call replay events where great practices that people have created like healing circles or drumming circles or softball teams, whatever people have created that has helped them to survive in their communities, we do events that actually replicate that and teach a whole other generation of people about what it took to put those things together and how they could be a resource for us today. In your 13 years of, of activism, of conducting these workshops, of hearing from women of all generations in your workshops, what would you say are maybe the top two or top three uh, concerns um, of African American women that really need to be addressed um, and would kind of impact the other issues 
that, that, that plague African American women? I think that's a great question. I think the two things that I would point to would definitely be economic issues. I think that the choices that African American women are able to make towards their own power are often limited by the economic role that they play or the economic challenges that they face. So I mean, I, I think that resources, being able to feed yourself and feed the people that you love is definitely a key issue that is facing a lot of people. And even preemptively for young women, looking at their lives in a way that has them know that there are limited options that they have because of the economic system that we live in. So that would be a major, if, there, if we could have transformation around that and if we all had what we needed to really feed our families and um, live the way that we wanted, I think we would see a lot more purposeful, passionate black women doing all sorts of creative things. And then I also think that trauma is an important issue to talk about in our communities. In the whole lifetime, a little short time that I've had as an activist, I've seen it over and over again that many people in African American communities, like in all communities, are survivors of gendered violence or physical abuse or sexual abuse. And those waves of trauma continue. So the healing that we really need in our communities across generations is huge, and I think that would make a huge difference because there is a way that our power is stifled when we're still in recovery. And there's a lot of silence also across generations when there's violence involved. Talk a little bit more about the silence and other obstacles to the healing um, for African American women. Absolutely. I think one of the things that we've learned as we've interviewed folks in the Mobile Homecoming Project and as we've been doing these workshops and also especially working with Ubuntu, a women of color survivor-led coalition to end gendered violence, is that often folks who are survivors of violence are very afraid to talk about violence. They're afraid that violence will happen to the people that they love most. And so there's a profound silence about experiences that people have had with sexual assault, with physical abuse and even silence about the lessons that they may have learned from those journeys, because they really want to protect the people in their lives. And I can identify with this personally. We want to protect the people in our lives from the worst things that we've experienced, and we just hope that it won't happen to other people that we love. But the truth is that these issues are so prevalent that every piece of insight that we have learned can help someone else. And that if we really want to end cycles of violence in our families and in our communities and in our workplaces and in all the, all the spaces where people experience violence, we do have to tell our stories and we do have to let younger women know what our history has been so hopefully they can have a very different experience. Why is it personal to you? It's personal to me because I survived sexual violence during my freshman year of college from another student, a fellow student activist, and it's something I didn't want to talk about. It took me a long time to talk about it. I never talked about it on my campus. And I even worked in rape crisis on my, on my own campus and didn't identify my own experience because I was afraid to. And it took a long time for me to share it with my family, even though I always knew they would be supportive, because I didn't think it was fair for them to be hurt by someone else's action that they never should have taken. You know? And so it took me a long time to realize that actually it's important for me to tell my story. And there's something that my family can learn, and there's insight that my whole community can have from knowing what happened to me and knowing how I, how I healed from it and what I learned from that experience. But I, I can completely understand why people are silent. It's very, it's, there are many, many black women who want to protect other people more than they want to necessarily express themselves. And sometimes it can be a barrier to our own healing. And it, it's, as a black feminist, I know that the more powerful I am as a black woman, the, whole, the more powerful my whole community is. And so it's, it's just been a process of learning. The more whole I am, the more whole we all are. Wow. Um, let's talk about another uh, black feminist who has inspired your work, uh, Polly Murray. Yes. Um, Polly Murray. Our very own Polly Murray, who grew up in Durham in the West End neighborhood where I live now and commune with her spirit <laughs> all of the time. Polly Murray was an amazing activist on so many fronts. So she was somebody who was a civil rights activist. She was somebody who was challenging segregation on trains. She was somebody who was challenging segregation in the higher education system. She was one of the first people to advocate for women to be able to serve on juries. So when it came to gender and when it came to race, she was somebody who has really been celebrated as a civil rights activist. She was an amazing civil rights lawyer. She was also a poet. She was also a theologian. And she was the first black female Episcopal priest. 
and she also was somebody who thought about gender in really complicated ways. So she was also one of the first people to advocate for hormone, hormone therapy, which is something that the transgender community right now faces. So she's somebody who was so ahead of their time in terms of advocating for her rights and thinking about her identity in ways that challenged the structures that existed. So it's very inspiring to be able to live in a community that she grew up in and continue to learn from her, her legacy. And I'm part of the Polly Murray Steering Committee. That we, there's a project just trying to uplift and amplify her legacy. And so as much as we can have people know that this amazing person was from Durham and we believe that all of the children who grow up in Durham, like Polly Murray did, can go on to do great things and to change our society. You're actually involved in quite a few projects, <laughs> and, and I had uh, asked you earlier before we began the taping, how do you earn your living, so to speak? But talk a little bit about um, the entrepreneurial aspect of, of who you are and how you are able to um, move from day to day and how you're supported. I think that's very important because a lot of people have great ideas and great things they want to do, but there's always that question. Like I raised earlier the economic question of like, okay, but if I go off and do these great things that are, that are my dreams, how am I going to eat? How am I going to support the other people who depend on me so they can eat? And so that, that is a real question. And so for me, it's been learning from other black feminists who've been very creative about their sources of income. So the Eternal Summer of the Black Feminist Mind and the Mobile Homecoming Project are both supported by a wide range of people, mostly the people who are most accountable, we are most accountable to in the programming. So people who identify with what we do, who, see it, who, who are black women, who are served by it. And there are monthly sustainers. There are people who donate $5 every single month, who donate $25 every single month because they can afford it. And then the other thing is that my work in universities and in larger nonprofit organizations where I facilitate workshops is also a way to bring money in so that I can offer the workshops that other folks attend, especially the, the workshops that are available here in Durham for free. Well, in, the, in addition to these black feminists, these incredible women who've inspired your work, I, I would imagine you've been inspired as well by your own family. Talk a little bit about what they do and how they've inspired Oh, the woman you've become. Definitely, definitely. My mother, Pauline Ann McKenzie, <laughs> is an amazing woman who's been an example to me my entire life. And she actually went back to school to become a therapist while she was already mother of three, which was a brave decision that had a major influence on, on me at, in terms of what powerful women can do. And she is a therapist who specializes on families and relationships and is just one of the most loving people that I know. So the fact that all of this work comes from love is something that is absolutely because of her influence. And my father has been a life coach and a motivational facilitator and an entrepreneur in his own right for, for my entire life. And he is a brilliant person, always has been supportive of myself and my sister as powerful black women and just an example of how we can be creative and we can transform the meaning of life um, by living it and by supporting other people to live their highest purpose. Now let's talk a little bit about the term beauty. Uh, beauty is actually in one of your, in, in your website I believe. Word is beauty? Oh yeah, Broken Beautiful Press. Broken Beautiful Press. Yes. Talk about uh, the concept of beauty and African American women and and are you doing any teaching to help them uh, embrace their true beauty? Absolutely. The Indigo series is completely about how can we understand ourselves as dynamic, powerful people who are beautiful because we actually are participating in the creation of the universe. We're creative people and so we make the world more beautiful by being true to ourselves and that's, that's huge for me. And the, the term Broken Beautiful actually came from a, an early um, self-published book that I wrote called Brown Sweet Broken Beautiful that was in tribute to black women. It had a lot of poems and praise of my mother, and my grandmother, and my sister, and just understanding that there are so many things that we experience as black women, and we may feel fragmented, and we may have um, wounds and scars, but we are amazingly beautiful in our resilience and our survival and how we continue to inspire each other and all the people around us. Is it easy to convey that message, especially to young women, you know, when, when the images that surround us um, are not, don't look like us? How, how hard is it to convey that message and have it received um, sincerely 
um, by those who are listening? I think it's very complicated. I think that you're right. There is a lot, a, a much larger force setting out images that are not complicated and that are not necessarily about the power of black women and girls. And so I think that it really takes creating intentional spaces where people really feel safe, where they feel honored for being themselves. And for me, it's like whatever it will take to have people feel honored is what we do. So in the mobile homecoming, we actually, I write a poem in praise of each visionary that we talk to. And now I actually, when you say that, are you talking about, when you say visionary, do you mean everyone who participates? Everyone who, who we have an in-depth conversation or interview with, I write a poem in advance that just honors them for being who they are. And my partner, Julia, creates a drum rhythm that she plays on the djembe to honor them. And I dance for them. And we culturally, I feel like that poetry and dance and music are our ways of affirming and honoring people. And of course, the, you know, the poetry as hip hop that we hear on the radio and the, the music that's there is sending messages that can be very compelling, but then aren't necessarily the powerful messages that we want to send. So we have to be very creative about having people be able to resonate with their own power and to be able to listen from a place that remembers what they already know, which is that they are powerful and they are beautiful, and it is a victory that they have survived everything and that they're here with us now. Now, you also are working on a documentary project. Talk about that. The documentary project comes out of the mobile homecoming work, so we're really, we're really amplifying this intergenerational experience of people lifting each other up and learning from each other's experiences. So the um, documentary will include these replay events, these intergenerational events that we've had, a lot of the wisdom and insight that we hear from these visionaries that we honor. And we're excited that it will be coming out in 2013. Um, it's also sponsored by Women Make Movies as, as our fiscal sponsor, which we're really excited about because it puts it in the legacy of great films made by other feminists on a range of issues that are really important to our communities. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, I'm going to ask you about another project. Um, are, the, uh, are you still working on the Juneteenth Academy? Yes, the Juneteenth Freedom Academy is in honor of June Jordan, and it's a way, I actually had the honor of being the first person to do research at Harvard in the papers of June Jordan. So I found out all of this amazing information about her life as a poet, as an activist, as a teacher, and um, she is so inspiring. So I wanted to bring that information directly back to our community. So there are different components of the Juneteenth Freedom Academy, one specifically about her protest poetry, and one specifically about her solidarity with the Palestinian movement, and one specifically for educators, because she was a lifelong educator in a number of settings. So the Juneteenth Freedom Academy for Educators was a week-long summer intensive that educators from around the region attended, and now we're in a phase where they're actually bringing it back to their communities through the Juneteenth webinars and sharing this, in, this information. So June Jordan is somebody, like many black feminists, whose presence is powerful and inspiring for our communities, and it's exciting to be able to work with her legacy. And as we're wrapping up, um, share with us what the cost is for one, to attend one of the workshops or to ask you to design a workshop for a church or a, a small group. Will you do that kind of thing? I would love to. <laughs> I love to design new workshops. I love to work with new groups of people. And there's actually a, a range of costs. So from $100 to for like a small living room thing to maybe $4,000 for something at a large university and everything in between. So I would love to hear from anyone who has a group of folks that they would like to bring this information to about what we can set up. And in our last seconds, just clarify for folks out there who may not quite understand uh, what black feminism is. What is it and what is it not? Black feminism is an amazing movement and it talks about multiple forms of oppression. So black feminists have been the creative people who've said that because black women are powerful, we understand that all people can be powerful. And it's, it's about keeping it complicated, that we're not only black and we're not only women, we're actually our whole selves all of the time. So black feminism is a movement that affirms all black women and affirms black communities by empowering the role of women within them. Dr. Alexis Pauline Gums, what a pleasure it's been. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you so much for inviting me. <laughs> for more information or to get in touch with today's guest, please visit us online at unctv.org slash BIF. You'll find links to email us your comments and join us as fans of BIF on Facebook. Or you can call us on the BIF line at 919 
549-7167. Be sure to meet us right back here each Sunday afternoon at 430 for Black Issues Forum. I'm Deborah Holt Noel. Thank you for spending your time with us. Quality Public Television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV.